and before I move into our conversation with Jay Tom today, just a brief overview of what to expect this evening. So this is neither a webinar nor a workshop, but something in between. It's more like an extended conversation with all of you gathered. Um, I'm going to chat with Jay for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then you'll have a chance to ask any immediate questions. Uh, and then we'll break into rooms so that you can take the discussion a bit deeper through talking and listening with each other. And then we'll all come back in uh, for another chance to share your ideas with Jay. Uh, and a couple of words on the elephant. So over the past three years, the Alternative UK has been asking the question, if politics is broken, what's the alternative? And one thing that became clear to us is that the current politics is part of or in service to a social economic system that is busy destroying our planet. Some people call it the growth economy. We won't be able to deliver a new politics until we have a good sense of what the new social economic system that it would be part of. And the elephant is the project that tries to name that new system. The thing that we know is there, we know it's there, but we don't quite know yet how to talk about it or to give it a clear structure. So last December, we gathered 30 people together who we felt have been busy creating that system, maybe for the past few decades, but have not yet come together coherently. Um, and like the blind man and the elephant, each one can see a part of it but none of them can quite yet see the whole thing. And each episode of this uh, series invites one of these partially blind men or women to come and show us their perspective on the elephant in the hope that over the whole of this series, we'll begin to visualize it in our minds. So tonight I'd like to welcome Jay Tomt. Uh, give a wave, Jay. I think maybe sure everybody can see you and I'd invite you all to if you haven't already moved to the speaker view uh, so that uh, we can see Jay in the center of the screen and Jay is the director of the Reconomy Center in Totnes Devon he's a major thinker and practitioner in developing the economic and civic power of localities and towns Jay also teaches economics and perspectives on change at Plymouth University and also at Schumacher College and has co-founded numerous of what we call citizen action networks that turn local enterprise into the beginnings of a viable fourth sector economy. I've been working alongside Jay as part of the Control Shift Network and invited him into our elephant compound in December last year. So welcome, Jay. Uh, over to you, Jay, in fact, um, perhaps you'd like to spend uh, or, you know, use the next 20 minutes or so just to introduce yourself to us uh, and, and get to the heart of what it is that you uh, would like us to understand about the opportunity of this moment. Well, um, okay, I'll do my best. Uh, it's quite an introduction, Indra. I don't know if I could live up to that, or all of it anyway. Some of it's true. Um, hello, everyone. I recognize a few of you. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Roxy. Hi, Roz. Hi, Fiona. Um, hi, Wes. Um, and uh, good to meet all the rest of you. Um, I don't know where to begin. So uh, I guess I'll start by saying I'm down here in, in Totnes in Devon and got involved in the trend uh, in transition town Totnes about 10 years ago and helped to launch the Reconomy project and uh, the Reconomy project kind of uh, uh, came out of work that included um, looking at economic change through the lens of economic relocalization and so for the last 10 years, working in the Reconomy Project and um, related projects and networks, it's been all about sort of developing uh, work in, in sort of that frame, but not only that frame, I think um, we get a little bit too caught up in these various brands of, of new economic thinking and doing. So uh, we've been very pragmatic in terms of 
of uh, learning wherever the learning is to be had. So I come from Silicon Valley and I learned a lot from that experience. And um, uh, there's a lot to be learned uh, all over the place in solidarity economy, uh, community wealth building or the anchor institution uh, model that is um, mildly famous here in Britain because of the work happened in Preston. Um, the degrowth movement, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, um, you know, always we've been looking for opportunities locally anyway, to develop networks, develop relationships, to, to uh, look for opportunities to kind of occupy that adjacent possibility to either um, develop new models or somehow transmit uh, know-how. Um, this is how we got involved in control shift. Um, we also started doing something that was very control shifty about um, five or six years ago, something we called the Devon Convergence, which is aimed at, at uh, trying to spark a network in this region that could become a movement. Um, I don't think we yet have a new economy movement, but we don't have one in this in this region yet, and we don't have one in this country, I, I would argue. Um, but we have lots of networks and lots of lots of positive change happens through networks. And one of the things that that happened uh, for us through the, the demo convergence is that we got some people in Torbay excited and we launched um, kind of a sister project we call Local Spark Torbay that is aiming to um, also be a spark for economic relocalization, solidarity economy and so forth in a place that is impoverished. Um, it's a typical coastal city with um, high uh, inequality, um, very reliant upon tourism, lots of, um, lots of disillusionment and so on. And slowly we're, we're kind of making headway. One of the, um, just enter a break in any time, but um, I can keep going. I think. Um, yeah. So, the, what yeah. you what you what you're giving us is a the, is is the in a way the reason that you started and what the context is. But I wonder if we could move to the question of if we're, um, you know, it's understood, isn't it, that we're heading for a depression? You know, we've yeah. had uh, the arrest of a lot of ec economic activity. There's been a huge amount of spending and, you know, we're looking at a depression at the sort of national level. In that context, what do you feel that localism has to offer? Thanks for asking. I was just about to, to go there myself um, because um, I think our experience in places like Torbay uh, helped to give us the answer. Um, we are headed to economic hard times, for sure. And I think that was probably true even without this pandemic. So this just helps to bring things into focus. And um, what it's, I think what, uh, one of the effects that it's having is it's creating an openness for change amongst, certainly amongst the people who are in our networks, uh, because you hear people having the same conversations, you know, when when you're out on the street, you know, six feet away. Um, oh, it's so nice not, not having the traffic. It's so nice to have the clean air and to hear the birds and so on and so forth. So nice to work at home. And um, that's great if you're sort of in that privileged position to be able to enjoy those things. Um, but it's also, it's also kind of scary, especially if you don't have a, a big bank account or a safety net uh, and so on. But um, it, this whole thing, regardless of where you are on that spectrum, it's either opening you up or it's, or it's making crystal clear um, certain things about the existing system. Uh, one of the things that's clear is that it's fragile. Um, one of the things that's clear is that we're overly reliant upon um, uh, global suppliers for things that we should be able to do ourselves. So, we all know that the NHS has been suffering shortages of masks and, and scrubs and other things. Um, they sent an Air Force jet to Turkey to pick up an, uh, an order of scrubs. 
these are things that we could be making here locally. And in fact, uh, in those places where there are fab labs and, and digital printers, uh, people have been doing that. They've been, people have been making, you know, sort of rallying together to make masks and, and uh, scrubs and things in sort of ad hoc um, ways. Um, the other thing I think that has become clear to people is that there is plenty of money to do all the things that we need to do. And there always has been. Um, so trillions uh, suddenly appeared 10 years ago to bail out the banks. And suddenly now after, after 10 years of hearing we don't have money, suddenly there are trillions more available. So um, one, th one thing I guess uh, that all this leads to, I hope, is that it will activate more people to be um, to be more engaged in the, in the political process and to participate more. Second thing is that it has, uh, it has, I suppose, created an opening for that natural bubbling up of kind of, um, of uh, citizen responsibility, people taking action because it's the right thing to do. Uh, a friend of mine calls this, um, Oh, what does he call it? He calls it, um, oh, I don't remember. It's a great, uh, something like the divine um, calling, whatever. Uh, but anyway, people, because it's the right thing to do, because people want to do good, people have responded. There are mutual aid groups that have popped up all over the place and all kinds of other ad hoc groups to, to make scrubs, to make masks, to make other things. And so uh, this, I think, is, is something that uh, can and should be uh, built upon. Um, I think one of the other things that comes along with it is a greater openness amongst um, lo people in local authorities, whether they're elected officials or officers. And this is something that we're seeing in Devon. So very often, well, I would say probably 99% of the time that these people actually live in the area. They care as much about these the places where they live and work as everyone else and they uh, they're human beings and and they're responding like human beings even though they're stuck in a system maybe that is um, uh, maybe somewhat oppressive or not quite um, amenable to change but these human beings are and I think that's going to create a lot of opportunities for doing things things uh, differently too so what we've seen locally is those opportunities um, uh, emerging and um, it gives us an opportunity to have different kinds of conversations. So the things that, that we're kind of putting out there and promoting are things that in the short run could help to ameliorate the, the uh, negative effects of this downturn. And this is all about solidarity. So encouraging people to grow food, encouraging people to look for opportunities to start up um, enterprises uh, in the area that could be food related or not food related, but around provisioning uh, basic needs. Um, let schemes and time banks and, and uh, others of these kind of solidarity networks, I think are really important. Uh, a second level, I think is uh, a little bit more strategic. So uh, I'm involved with, I, it's a network of maybe a hundred or so people who are, who are, uh, creating the conditions at this moment to launch um, a mutual credit network. It would be a business to business mutual credit work, uh, network in this country. It would probably roll out um, regionally. And um, that's the kind of thing that would A, help to ameliorate uh, shortages of, of cash and liquidity in the shorter uh, time frame, but in the longer time frame would, would create the conditions for more, um, more uh, widespread change. And then the third thing, which is more strategic and requires a bit more campaigning or at least some uh, opportunistic uh, entrepreneurship are um, sort of Green New Deal related proposals. And uh, there are some that, that I think would be fantastic if we could get the ear of, of um, people in national politics. I'm not sure we will, but you know, there was the New Deal. Um, now the Green New Deal is, um, 
is something that is being talked about in just about every industrialized country. Uh, not all of these include um, provisions for really supporting uh, a shift toward a more bioregional uh, economic system. I think this is where ultimately we need to go. Um, there are some things that could be done. So, so uh, in these Green New Deal proposals, um, there are provisions for just transitions to help um, people who are in fossil fuel industries or airline industries or others to transition into something else. This is a great opportunity to help these folks and these businesses transition into, um, into models that are more bioregionally appropriate with more of a local focus. Um, I would love to see uh, something that is specifically about funding um, and, uh, and developing ecosystems that can support more sort of community, um, community supported entrepreneurship or uh, enterprise or regionally supported entrepreneurship or enterprise. So more incubators, more co-working spaces, more, more um, seed funding, uh, grant funds and, and loan funds. Um, another thing that I think is, is kind of a no brainer uh, after all of this is really investing in, in uh, local food systems. Uh, it's, again, this, this could be paired with a just transition. There are a lot of uh, farmers who are older. I think the average age of farmers is something like 59 or 60. Um, a lot of farmers, especially in the Southwest, are raising uh, animals for meat. Uh, but we know we need more vegetables. So a just transition kind of program to help these folks um, make the shift and providing money to, to really um, make more robust and resilient the food system, I think is, is also kind of a no-brainer. Um, also, uh, uh, doing something to support the, the NHS with provisioning the kinds of things that could be that could be produced here in this country. And um, I don't know if you've all heard of the, the Southwest Mutual or, or um, there are uh, a few other similar community banks or community facing banks that are, are starting up and they're, they're part of a franchise model. And I think that kind of thing would be great to um, to provide the backbone for regionally located cooperatives that were able to flexibly produce scrubs, masks, ventilators, and other bits of kit that uh, are crucial for the NHS. They would provide uh, jobs and uh, uh, you know meaningful livelihoods for people in in local places all over. So. Um, I kind of um, talked myself out onto a limb now. Help me out with the question here, Andrea. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to help you with a question. So, I mean, you've 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 um, described such a lot of activity, and I would say, over the years, you know, observing what you're doing, uh, Devon Convergence and the local Spark and Torbay, what I've been so impressed with is the um, the willingness in the sense to take things into your own hands and get on with it you know the sort of spirit of well, we're going to get on with this we'll do this anyway in the light of maybe a more national conversation about how difficult it is to achieve so for example you know when we're thinking about the environmental goals and a government that really won't consider you know moving towards them at the pace that's required really thinking about 2050 as a goal that at the regional and local levels, a lot of people are just saying, well, we're just going to move ahead anyway. And that, that spirit, um, you know, could you talk a little bit more about that, that spirit of uh, autonomy or uh, it's sort of an independent sort of spirit? Um, because I feel that that lack of that might somehow be an obstacle if we don't, if we can't foster that in some way that if we're still waiting for permission in some sort of way, it, does that end up being an obstacle? How did you forge that? Yes. How did you forge that, basically? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just left you with yes to say that. No, but, I just, I had to, yeah. it was, that was a pregnant pause. Yeah. Um, 
No, I think I think that's a key that's a key thing, um, and you know maybe it's the key thing. Um, do you want to be a citizen or do you want to be a sheep? Do you want to uh, do you want to take responsibility for your own life or leave it to other people? And I'm using I'm saying you in you know sort of the use the the generic third person. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody here on this call, <laughs> but. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we, we have a choice about how we live our lives and, um, and uh, we are ostensibly citizens in a, in a democracy. And um, it's, no use, it's no use bitching and moaning all the flippin' time on social media. Um, and, uh, and I think it's important to, to campaign but uh, there's a lot of campaigning, which is just about ask, getting other people to do something. There's so much that we can do. And, um, and so I think uh, what I'm talking about is, is sort of the new citizen. Um, and the new citizen has, uh, has uh, agency uh, across a, a wide range of um, endeavors, political and economic. So we don't stop being a citizen when we cross the shop floor. Um, we're not only a citizen uh, once every four years, we're, we're a citizen every day. And if that means investing in a, a local company or starting a local company up, that is, that, you know, that is part of what it means to be a citizen who is actively engaged in the civic life of their own democracy. So this is, this is, my starting point anyway. And so what, what we've all tried to do down here and what I've tried to do in other work, and I'm obviously I'm not the only one, um, and my colleagues are not the only ones, is, is really focus on our own agency and the kind of um, impact that we can have locally, regionally, internationally. It's uh, in part about um, being opportunistic, but also it is about uh, being observant for those opportunities to make change, to occupy that adjacent possible, so to speak. And if you are, if you have some understanding of complexity theory and how change happens in that context, then, then you realize the importance of, of those kinds of acts. And so it's relational. It's, it's about having conversations and as trivial as those kinds of things sound, they're, they're super important because they create the conditions for innovations to emerge and for innovations to spread. So this is how we've gone about doing things down here. It's created some change. It's not created enough because we need more people who are willing to roll their sleeves up. We have um, uh, so much work to do. Uh, and it's about, it's, right now it's about doing it. Um, uh, there are many, there are many folks out there who are more eloquent than I am and, and uh, much more famous and have bigger audiences who, who talk about all the wonderful things that are happening all over the world, all these exemplars. Um, well, we know what to do. People are fond of saying, oh, well, you know, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Well, let's flip and distribute it. Um, people are fond of saying, well, we know all the solutions. They're out there. Well, let's implement them then. So um, that's what we've been trying to do down here. And part of what we have uh, sort of built into the Devon Convergence is, is sharing those things that are working. So um, creating the uh, opportunities for people who are doing things that are working to be in front of other people to share that know-how. That is so important for driving change, sharing the know-how. And um, that, that means, uh, you know, uh, being shoulder to shoulder uh, with somebody who knows what they're doing to, to learn and, and get that knowledge. And, and this is what I mean in this context. So um, probably all of you were here because you're interested in the new economy. Um, how many of you know how to do uh, start up a co-op or do uh, you know, any of the other things that represent these new models? Some of you may know, but this is the kind of know-how that needs to spread everywhere uh, and more. Uh, so, um, 
this is, uh, I think, at the heart of how we drive change is how do we, how do we um, build up that capacity? How do we build up the know-how to be able to start the co-ops? Um, how to convene spaces like the Dem and Convergence or how to start networks like the Citizen Action Networks? Um, one of the projects that we have through our international community of practice is to try to identify the top 100 uh, solutions that could be or should be replicated. So the idea is that, okay, if, if there really are, um, you know, these solutions and exemplars all over that represent the future, what are they? Um, if we can identify them, then we, you know, then we can say, ah, well, here's the list of 100. If every town had five of these, or if every city had 25 of these, we'd be, we'd be halfway there. So. How close are you to that? How listing, close? yeah, listing well, the 25. Or the, uh, or the 20, whatever you Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's in the first phase right now. We're, we're just collecting exemplars now. The second phase will be evaluating them. We may end up with less than 100 but that's okay, we can aspire. And I think the process is more important and the stories that we can tell about this list will be more important in the end than saying, you know, here's the recipe book. Right, you've just opened up a new question there and I'm just gonna make this the last question before uh, we go into our breakout rooms, which is uh, what you just said, that it's more important to be able to tell the story uh, and to build the relationships. So could you, from using maybe Devon Convergence as your example, as, your, as the thing that you've been working on for some time, can you just talk a little bit more about why that's true? Uh, uh, well, I think because at the end of the day, people, people have to think for themselves. That's the most important thing, really. Of all the most important things that I've, I might have said already, that's the most important thing. Think for yourself. Don't um, don't try to adopt the you know the models or the the reasoning of, of somebody else, however attractive they might be, however progressive they might be. Listen to it, um, evaluate it, do some research. Think for yourself, and then uh, and then do what makes sense. So this is why uh, this is why I say. Um, it's more important to kind of go through that process of, of identifying these exemplars as replicable uh, projects and to tell stories about them because I think these are the kinds of things that, that begin to animate that thinking for oneself. Um, and when you do, you, you, contribute, to, you, you contribute to the, the network of brains that are, you know, trying to, to advance the change and and you become an active participant in that process yourself. Um, I see so many amazing projects out there, and um, the ones that are working are the ones where this kind of this kind of attitude has taken place. And I've seen failures too. And and where I've seen the failures is when people try to, um, you know, follow the recipe book or paint by numbers, and be sort of orthodox in in following, you know following the rules, asking for permission and all that kind of stuff. Great. So before we go into the breakout rooms, actually, I just thought I'd open the room for uh, 15 minutes of questions. Uh, if anybody would like to put a question to Jay now, um, I would suggest since there's more of you than we can see just in the gallery, if you could use the um, raise hand option in your participants box. So if somebody would like to put a question to Jay about uh, all that he's introduced to us. Then Maria, I think you've got your eye on the box. Uh, if anybody has a problem raising their hand, then please raise it physically and we'll try our best to keep track. Maria, over to you. Yep, so first on the list is um, Fiona. Over to you, Fiona. Unmute, Fiona. Fiona, unmute. <laughs> yeah, can't hear you. No, 
Go back one again. Somebody else like to ask a question? <laughs> uh, Sydney, Sydney Thornbury, I'd raise your hand. We'll come back to you in a minute, Fiona. Sydney. Is it on mute? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, Jay, I, um, I'm from Los Angeles, Jay, by the way. Um, so fellow Californian. Uh, but I've lived here for a long time and I run uh, arts organizations and usually uh, go in and change their models to more social enterprise based. And I'm quite fascinated with the relationship between um, creative enterprises, creativity, social enterprise and, and new economic um, models. The place I run at the moment is in Wakefield in um, Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, uh, which is a very deprived area. Um, and I'm just wondering what your experience with um, creative industry, uh, creative enterprises has been in Devon. Have they played an important role um, in what you're doing down there? Do you think it plays an important role? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. <clears throat> and, uh, Yes. Um, well, be, because it's, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky. I think um, down here, there has been uh, some, some really good stuff coming from creative uh, social enterprises of various kinds. Um, in fact, huge, huge positive changes. Uh, one of the things that is challenging about social enterprises that don't have uh, sort of a robust business model is that they're always dependent upon grants. And so this creates a bit of a limiting uh, factor, but, but down here in Torbay, we, um, well, uh, a million pounds came in as part of uh, a big cultural program. I think it was coming from the design council and others. And um, that was great for, for uh, the cultural industry down here. Um, some of the, the social enterprises that have come out of it uh, or were supported by it have been working for progressive change in one way or another. Um, there's another uh, outfit in Totnes, which has just closed its doors after I think about 15 years called, um, uh, what were they called? Uh, oh, I can't think of their name. But um, help me if somebody knows uh, Ruth Benthoven. Anyway, um, they were they were fantastic in supporting uh, other social enterprises and really kind of creating some uh, some engagement. So yeah, creative industry is is really an important piece of the puzzle. Great. Um, Mary has a question. Um, when you said uh, mutual credit, um, I'm wondering if, can you hear me? Is it loud enough? Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if you're thinking about um, local exchange trading schemes and if you're in touch with what's going on in Devon. Is that, is that what you mean by mutual credit? Well, the, the mutual credit concept includes, includes that. Um, uh, I, think, I think there are two levels. So uh, in terms of uh, sort of the, the typical kind of, you know, let's schemes, those kinds of, you know, time banks and so on, I think I think we really need more of that kind of thing to weather this economic storm that's coming, or at least um, it will be a good safety net for some people who, who could benefit from those kinds of models. We don't actually have one in Totnes. There was one for a while. They, um, they are difficult at times to sustain, but there's a good time bank system in Plymouth and one in, in Torbay also. Um, the mutual credit system that I referred to was a, a more robust kind of business to business system. 
So many of you might have heard of the Veer in Switzerland or the Sardex in Sardinia. That's more the model that, um, that I think would be, uh, that would be a good addition to the economy here in Britain and would certainly um, provide a bit of cushion for businesses who are at the margins uh, when hard times hit. So um, that's the kind of thing that um, I think is uh, an important next step and something that we're going to be trying to make happen down here. And uh, are you in touch with, with uh, that sort of uh, model um, elsewhere in the UK? Um, uh, like there. Open Credit Network, are you in this touch is, this with is, yeah, this is the group I'm talking about. Okay, good. Yeah. Can't hear you, Maria. Sorry. Um, would Fiona like to ask a question again? If you can get the unmute. Mm, sadly. Okay. As, the, as the host, can you unmute her? Um, can you type it? Okay. Okay. That's not no. Yeah. Ah, hurrah. There we go. Oh, yeah. That worked. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I was really excited by what you were talking about, Jay, about um, that we have a sense of collective minds rather than being too overly uniform, as in kind of. Uh, following another's blueprint that we have innovation within what we're doing and um, I just wanted to ask about um, thinking about conflict resolution models about the whole theme of um, not being oppositional I meant I heard you were talking about on Facebook not being overcritical, critical but something about working not from a place of opposition but from a place of inclusion and finding meeting points and um, I'm, I'm kind of making that as a comparison but from that idea of kind of preaching to the converted that you know everyone's on board but um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are about that about the, the um, I flagged it up and someone said oh we'll drag people in and I thought well that's you know that's kind of not really how it works I just wonder about your thoughts about that. Mm. Oh, well, if I, I guess I'm, I'm getting a couple of things from, uh, from your question. Um, yes, I think it's absolutely the right thing to do to find uh, common ground and to find ways of uh, including people into conversations of various kinds. Mm -hmm. um, too often we do um, kind of get the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. um, to, to meetings like this and, and, um, and other sorts of things. And so the key thing I think is having different conversations with different people. And um, I'm not saying that to be funny, but really that's the, that's the key, that's the essence for bridging into new networks. Mm -hmm. So very often we, we end up talking to the same people and uh, it's because we're using the same language, mm -hmm. um, we're on the same mailing list, we're kind of pinging the same sort of people who know everybody else in our networks and so on. Mm -hmm. So becoming sort of multilingual mm -hmm. and curious and adventurous is I think how we, how we um, as connected minds in our networks can begin to to uh, spread those things that are worth spreading mm -hmm. um, into, into different realms, different uh, networks of different people. Um, it's not easy. So we need, to, we need to either A, identify ourselves as being a bridge and to play that role of, of you know, sort of network uh, envoy and diplomat uh, mm -hmm. or identify people who are in our groups who can have those conversations. And so from a local, at a local level, it's it's um, it's funny because we we have lots of little networks and sometimes even the ones where you look you look at them from outside and you think well surely they're talking to each other but no there's the food serv food sovereignty people 
-hmm. you don't talk to the local energy people. Mm -hmm. Makes no sense. So what's the key thing? Well, part of it is, you know, we're wrapped up in our own business, but also we're not that curious. And, and so if we want to, um, we want to make economic change and political change across a wider, you know, in other words, if we want to be effective, if we're tired of being marginal, Mm -hmm. um, then yeah. we need to uh, find ways of talking to people who are in the council, which mm -hmm. means having using a different vocabulary, being a little bit more empathetic, and and finding you know those patches of common ground where we can you know build a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. So um, I think we it'd be a good moment now to move into our breakout rooms, which Marie is going to uh, organize. Um, and the question that I'd invite you to ask yourselves uh, and discuss amongst you is as you know, in this moment, as we're heading into a depression, do you feel that localism has is the answer that um, what we do in the communities where we live can be a, a resource um, as at the national level, we seem to be running out of resources. Um, and if so, you know, what, what would be the obstacles to you doing that? Uh, I'm going to leave it there. And when we come back, we'll have 20 minutes to discuss with each other again and to share our thoughts with Jay. And I'll see you at the other side. So this next uh, 20 minutes is really for you to share your thoughts, um, some, maybe something that you heard in your discussion room or that you yourself were experiencing in that discussion uh, or examples that you might want to bring, but also any question that um, you may want to put to Jay uh, as a result of your discussion. All of that is uh, open and free for you to use this time. Um, we'll go the same way as we did before. Um, Maria, I can see the hands, so maybe I'll, I'll do the hands. Uh, if everybody would like to use the raise hands option. And who's going to be the first person to look at your faces? I know you've had great discussions. <laughs> no, I'm guessing. Who'd like to make a comment or offer something? Roxy, you're raising your physical hand and your <laughs> digital hand. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, I had a question which is about how, how, what sort of role does, could community wealth building play um, in localization, I guess? Resilience. Good question. Maybe, Jay, since there's not a lot of hands, maybe answer it straight away. Okay. Um, well, it can it can play a role. Um, it's it's a great you know we were talking a little bit about framing. It's a great frame community wealth building. It doesn't. I don't think it really kind of tells the whole story about what's behind it, which is mostly about and in this country, it's mostly about um, getting anchor institutions that are that are um, kind of tied in with the council to shift their procurement to support um, local, uh, hopefully pro-social businesses, and um, that's a great thing. It's definitely part of the mix, and I think um, uh, it's important for the various flavors of uh, sort of new economic thinking and doing to get behind a, a bigger uh, narrative such that we all just, you know, can say, well, obviously anchor institutions, relocalization, solidarity economy, co-ops, um, fab labs, mutual credit schemes. This is part of the package that is part of the solution that we're trying to put forward. You just explain for the few of us who don't know what wealth community wealth might be. 
Could you just explain it in a few? Well, lines? it's like I say, it's it's a great frame. It comes from the states and um, from the uh, Democracy Collaborative, who was one of the motivators of a project in Cleveland, Ohio. So Rust Belt City, um, factories uh, moving, you know, every year to Mexico or China or someplace and taking those jobs with them. So a, a greater number of um, working age men losing their livelihoods. And so they said, well, what can we do? Well, we need, we want to provide jobs, meaningful jobs for these guys somehow, um, for men and women. And so uh, what can we do? Well, why don't we start up a cooperative and, um, and we'll get the local hospital to become the, the, the anchor customer. And um, they refer to this hospital as being an anchor institution, as being anchored to the place. It's not going anywhere. Um, but also, it kind of works in this other sense too, being sort of the main customer. So um, they started that up and uh, the hospital uh, employed the, or hired the, the worker cooperative to do laundry. And then the worker cooperative developed another cooperative to grow greens for the, the food service and so on. And uh, they could have just said, hey, this is the anchor institution model. But, but one of the key things is that uh, by shifting procurement to local, to businesses in the local economy, that um, then increases the local multiplier effect. So the money circulates locally longer, and as it does, it creates more income, more buying power. And so community wealth building is, um, is hopefully what happens. Great, thank you. That really helps to, to, to imagine it happening in a local area. Um, Fiona, you've got your hand up. Fiona, if you've got a muting problem again. Maria, would you like to unmute? To me. Sorry, I, I'm not brilliant with tech. Um, I was in a group with Will, Charlie and Graham. I, I see Charlie had his hand up as well. Um, but we were talking about um, the issue of even though there might be databases of resources out there that are available um, for scaling up sort of knowledge tools, that kind of thing. There can be the issue of, well, I was talking about, um, there's a forest of information and how that can, that can be kind of disempowering if you like. So then we, we moved on to the idea of community mentoring where, um, possibly group mentoring in fact, so that there were individuals um, mentoring rather than just putting information out there. Um, I don't know if anyone from my group would like to add to that, but I don't know. I mean, is that partly what's going on anyway with these Zoom groups in effect? What, what are your thoughts, Jane? Charlie, I think you were wanting to speak. Sorry, go on. Yeah. I just want to jump back one just to the community wealth building, um, just to say something about what we're trying to do in, in the north of Ireland on that. And when I got, I sort of struggled with it because I work for an organization called Development Trust and we're a network of community development trusts. Mm -hmm. And in the narrative around community wealth building, we saw a space that communities, you know, un inhabit in terms of public service, in terms of place shaping, in terms of civic engagement, local democracy, participation. And we saw an opportunity. Well, I saw an opportunity in that to to locate communities and community voices within within that agenda. But what we struggled with in the north of Ireland is in, in sort of advancing community wealth building. Here, we find ourselves if we were to take it to Cleveland and the Preston model, and the North Ayrshire model, and the Wales model, is actually doing the work for local government. And for me, part of the problem is within local government, you still have the orthodoxy of the dominant thinking around the economy, around place shaping, and that's a challenge in and of itself. But the, princip the principles of it, I think, really work in terms of taking public money and thinking how public money can be used to be generative in terms of stimulating um, economies of local places. The issue for us in that is when you are using public money to either redefine or reshape public services, and I think the current crisis creates an opportunity for us to do that, 
even if we're thinking about public health services. The question for me in that is, well, where does community and community business sit, you know, within the potential emerging supply chain? And so that's the sort of approach we've been taking to community wealth building and pushing that argument in the north of Ireland, saying that in principle it's, it's a good thing. And our local government structures are not like your local government structures in Scotland and England. They're still relatively powerless. Um, but nonetheless, I do think within that there's an opportunity, if we can get the culture within those organisations to recognise the power of community, that they keep talking about at the minute, and invest in potentially the emergence of cooperatives, worker cooperatives or community businesses in that, then we may be beginning to assist organisations in terms of transforming their, their local places, you know. And yes, I think the Zoom thing, uh, Fiona, is almost like a mentoring session in itself as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Charlie. Mm -hmm. So, th does that feel more like a partnership sort of uh, model, Charlie, between everything that's arising from within communities and the state? No, I, I still think the state here is largely deaf. So, I mean, I think it, it can. It gets the sound bites right in terms of the narrative around what needs to be done, but like power is still very much centralised. And sub-regionally, power is still very much centralised within public bodies. And breaking that thinking that, that power is a continuing challenge. And sometimes you will get innovative and creative individuals within those structures that will help you maybe make you know, strident moves in terms of change. But it's, it's, it's not a battle, but it's, it's a constant sort of push. I mean, I said in our discussion group, I think the main challenge that confronts us is a cultural one. And, you know, we need to think about how do we change the cultural identity of how we think about people, how we think about social organization, how we think about economy, how we think, you know, that's the bigger challenge. And unfortunately, systems themselves are, I don't know, they're, it's, it's, well, for me, it's part of the problem, money, you know, like, you know. So I don't know, like, I, you know, like we, we can work with the principles of that and we continue to work with the principles of that. I think it allows us an opportunity to develop the arguments around what community power actually should look like, what building community wealth actually means for citizens and individuals, how commissioning and procurement can be used to that better effect, you know what I mean? And how we can drive local economy. There's lots of creative stuff happening in the North of Ireland. There's lots of creative stuff happening in Devon and elsewhere in the regions in England and Scotland. It's, it's harnessing the learning from that and getting some sort of practical action from that in our local places, which, which is the key thing. I mean, one of the other things I keep talking about here is was we've like one of the best credit union sectors on, on these islands. You know, we've really well capitalized credit unions in our, our, our towns and villages mm -hmm. who have substantial resources at their disposal within their common bond area to invest in, you know, emerging ideas around economy in place, but there's no legislative framework to support them to do that, you know. So uh, those are the sorts of things we try and, and, Thank you. and challenge. Sorry, I'm rabbiting on. No, no, that's great. That's really helpful. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Manda, I think you'd like to contribute here. Uh, yeah, just quickly in response to that, Charlie, it's really interesting. We had a really interesting conversation about all sorts of things, actually. Uh, I'm sure the others might want to raise something that came up. But just in response to that, Charlie, I completely agree that this is a fundamentally, it's not even culturally, it's sort of psychosocial, really. The culture thing is something that happens afterwards we grow into, but we are rubbish at so much of this. And we're just doing it all over again. So we have an opportunity now with COVID-19 to develop uh, locally relevant and accessible systems for tracking and tracing. Um, and I've spoken to public health professionals who are tearing their hair out saying, we need them to be local. We need to have access to the data. We need to know what's happening. We need to know how we can engage with, and we need to do it in such a way that the local communities who know what's happening are involved. And instead, we give it to Serco and Deloitte, mm -hmm. and, which is just beyond insane. And I, my question really is, um, the people who do that genuinely think, I think, that that's the best way of doing it. And I was just wondering if anybody in this group has come across people who are working inside those big institutions, anchor institutions, either power structures, who have, despite um, the ability of that infrastructure, of those infrastructures to stop you thinking um, in systems. Has anybody come across anybody who's willing to come across on the dark side? And I don't say that in a sort of um, <laughs> us and them sort of way, but I'm wondering, they could be incredibly valuable and inventive colleagues of ours if we are aware of all the people who are inside those institutions and despite 
the function and the culture of those institutions are, have, are finding ways to engage with us feral economists on the outside. That would be an incredibly valuable resource for us to know about. Just to answer, Thank you, Pat. I was going to pause to you. Yeah. yeah, just to answer that, Amanda, there's a guy called, uh, who's head of strategy at Redbridge Council. I think it's called Simon Hughes. Anyway, head of strategy at Redbridge Council, he's constantly tweeting publicly, you know, at, at risk of his job or not, about how, how poorly regarded uh, local structures and resources are for the COVID solutions. And I'm also noticed that a guy called Adam Lent, who's head of the local government network, like a think tank for local government, is also stamping his feet furiously about mm -hmm. this exact issue that you're talking about. So there are, there are, and, and again, ask, ask, come back to me afterwards because there's about six or seven of these people who have contacted us through observing the Daily Alternative and the newsletter over the years. So I'll talk to me and I'll give you some of their names. That would be great. And I wonder if collectively there is a sort of an invisible network of yes, creative of disruptors inside those institutions that we can work with collectively to ease that. It's a cultural battle sometimes. It's a very different mindset and they might be great allies. Thank you. Uh, I think Mary wanted to come in. I, I was wondering whether um, people think that the Labour Party, how much is the Labour Party in, in tune with these issues? Uh, do they want to centralise? The impression I got with their manifesto was they had, they had lots of ideas for um, uh, they didn't go for UDI, they went for universal basic services and they were talking about everybody having Wi-Fi. And I was wondering how much they're in tune with the idea of localism or if they wanted it all top down. And how much, uh, if, anyway. Um, Thanks, Mary. Uh, Jig, I'd like to invite you to respond in your experience. Um. <clears throat> Well, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the comments so far, and um, labor. Um, uh, who knows? <laughs> I um, I think that there are some people within the Labour Party who uh, who are kind of switched on to the kinds of things that need to happen. As, as an organization for social change, I think it is um, one of uh, a huge range in the field. It's an ecosystem that is full of uh, actors. And unfortunately, I think, in my opinion, uh, our political parties are a little bit archaic and dysfunctional. And um, especially at the subnational level, but maybe including the sub, maybe including the national level. Um, so that's that. And and I was kind of interested in your your uh, question there, Amanda, too, about we. I wonder who you meant by we. Um, so how do we identify these people who are within government that we can then engage to do blah blah blah, and. Um, I'm being, I know I'm being a little provocative here, but I think for me, it comes back to if we're, if we're interested in making change, then, then uh, through networks, through meetings like this and through other kinds of conversations, we, f we find uh, those possibilities that are, um, that are actionable by us, given our agency and our capabilities. And um, so to me, that's the more interesting question. How can I get from where I am now to another place I think we, all due respect, and you know, I'm only trying to be provocative. I might be full of shit at the end, at the end of the day. But I think, we, I think we, we, we put a lot on ourselves to try to, to try to understand the abstract arena within which all possible actions may take place. Trying to map the field, trying to understand abstractly who all the actors are and what the key levers are. And the truth is, you know, if you're a systems thinker, we don't really know what the key levers are. Um, so we, we um, should make the most of, of the things that we do know and, and work accordingly. And I think part of that means 
a big part of it means building power locally. And if it's about building power locally, it is um, coming back to, I think what you were talking about, Charlie, with, with regard to culture. It means doing those things in the place that we are that, that creates the conditions for that kind of culture change. So it creates, it creates the conditions for participation and, um, and uh, for people to kind of uh, step into their own agency as citizens. And what, I, what I've observed here in this region in terms of local politics is how absolutely abysmal the members of local parties are in terms of, <laughs> of acting at the local level in any kind of real political sense. Every four years, you know, they're, they're out there, um, you know, doing good work and, and banging on doors and all that kind of thing. But the kind of politics that we need now is an everyday kind of politics. And um, we, we, we can't, it's not good enough for us to, to say, oh, well, it's only a few of us who are switched on are gonna make change by finding the right people to talk to in the halls of power. We really need to, to find more ways of, of activating people on the ground. And not just for, you know, sort of uh, obviously overtly political reasons, but also, Who's going to start up? Um, who's going to start up the next economy? They. <laughs> so we have to create the conditions for uh, for more entrepreneurship, more participation, and more uh, you know more doing stuff. In my opinion. <laughs> Can I come back on that quickly, Jay? Yes. Very briefly, uh, Amanda, because we've run out of time. Okay, was, yeah. the we is, is, is very inclusive. And I know there are people inside those institutions that are desperate to work differently. And it's opening the space so that they can participate rather than finding a way to distinguish between us and them. Because I think the we that will create changes is whoever we want it to be. So I would agree, but I have a slightly different nuance. Before, Andrew, before Andrew speaks and says goodbye to you all, just as, as um, the guys involved with some of the tech with AUK. Thank you so much. It's nice to have been hung out with a room full of citizens. Mm -hmm. If you want to join us, become a co-creator, please go to the front of the site at www.thealternative.org.uk. Um, hit the co-creation button um, and you will be, uh, and you will come into our garden of democratic wonders. That's mm -hmm. me, thank you. And over to Andrew. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks very much for your intervention, Pat. It's quite mm -hmm. true, I might've forgotten to say that. Um, and just to wind up from, thank you very much everyone for taking part in this. We're having a lot of these Zoom calls and the feeling is a new one since this COVID crisis. Uh, and if we look back from the future at this moment in time as one in which, uh, yes, we, but many, many, many millions of eyes stand up for the first time uh, to take action simply because there's no other choice than to move into action of some kind. I think that will be the civilizational change that, that uh, we're all waiting for. So on that um, rather grand note, I'd like to thank Jay Thompson again. Jay, thanks very much for making all these connections for us between the self and the community and the impact on the world. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.